If you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 3. We're continuing our study there. If you've ever been to St. Louis, certainly you've seen the St. Louis Arch. And one of the neat things about the St. Louis Arch is that it's this giant monument that was built to commemorate the expansion out west, 639 feet tall. The irony is it's not only 639 feet tall, but in its structure, it's 639 feet wide as well. What's interesting about that, if you've ever been there, maybe you've seen the movies or have known this, but they built the arch structures independently of one another at the same time. And engineers say that if they were off by one 64th of an inch, it wouldn't connect correctly at the top. When they started out in this giant project, the insurers of the project felt like 13 people would certainly pass away. Due to the nature of the project, the fact that it was going to be high, nets were not going to be able to be used, but men dangling from cranes, it would be too much to keep all their lives. But certainly, if you know the story, not one person died in building the arch. If you've ever been to the top of the arch, you've ridden in this very unique tram system. Did you know that the person who worked on that, invented that, had no formal training in engineering whatsoever? His parents owned an elevator company. And so he took the best parts of an elevator and fashioned what you and I might call a Ferris wheel, and he basically put it together. It's still the same system that is used today. The project engineers thought that there'd be 5,000 workers on this project, but did you know it only took fewer than 100 to complete the St. Louis Arch? What's interesting about that is this monumental, literally monumental project was put together by a few, and they did an incredible work. You know, it doesn't matter how big the vision is, we can accomplish more together than apart. Simply, and you've heard this said before, teamwork makes the dream work. And in the book of Nehemiah, God has given Nehemiah an incredible vision to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. Jerusalem taken over and destroyed by the Babylonians. The Jewish people are in exile under Persian rule. They are socially displaced under poverty and oppression. Jews had returned to Jerusalem to try to rebuild the temple. And Ezra comes on this scene 120 years later. And in that begins to restore Jerusalem by restoring the Torah as an authority. And Ezra reminds us that he tried to rebuild the wall, but King Artaxerxes stopped the renovation project and decreed that it was no longer an opportunity but forbidden. So fast forward to the book of Nehemiah. We've been there a few weeks, Jewish exile, a cupbearer to the very king, King Artaxerxes. And he gets news that the wall is down, and still, after all these generations later, no one has built it back up. But yet, through prayer and through fasting, Nehemiah receives a great vision from God to do an impossible task. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but at my house, when I need an electrician, I call an electrician. When I need a guy to work on my septic tank, I call a septic tank guy. I don't call a baker or a banker or a butcher for those things. Those things, they may be trained in other areas, but when it comes to the needs of electricity or the needs of plumbing, I call the experts. Why does God call an exiled cupbearer to the enemy to go to a place he's never been to do something he's never done? And it could be that in your journey, God has asked you to do something You've never done and go to a place you've never been. But Jerusalem needs Nehemiah, and Nehemiah needs Jerusalem. God has given him this vision. So Nehemiah goes, and he surveys the work, and he's immediately faced with opposition from the leaders of surrounding areas not to rebuild the wall. So just recap for just a moment. So now God has called an exiled cupbearer to the enemy king to go to a place he's never been to do something he's never done in the face of opposition from the very beginning. If I were Nehemiah, I think I'd have turned around and walked right back home. But Nehemiah doesn't. He knows that for him to be able to accomplish a God-sized task, he would need 
God's people. That teamwork makes the dream work. And he calls all of Jerusalem, all the Jewish people together to join him in this impossible task. I want you to read with me in Nehemiah chapter 2, back one chapter. Chapter 2, starting verse 17, there's a unique calling to this truth here. Nehemiah calls the people, and I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. What's interesting is when Nehemiah calls the people to do something they've never done, the scripture says that they strengthened their hands for the good work. This literally means they encouraged one another. Now, if you know your Bible, go back one, uh, one book to Ezra, Ezra chapter 4. The people were trying to rebuild Jerusalem, but the enemies came upon them. The scripture says that he, we, they weakened their hands. They discouraged them here, Nehemiah, through his words and God's help over him and grace over him to the people. Their hands were strengthened. They were encouraged. They were no longer defeated, no longer delusioned. They were renewed, refreshed, and re-energized to do something that had not been done. Which opens us up to Nehemiah chapter 3. Nehemiah chapter 3, if you've got your copy of God's Word, I encourage you to follow along with me. We're going to read the first five verses. When Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with the brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hanil. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zakur, the son of Imri, built. The sons of Hassaniah built the fish gate, laid its beams, and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hazak, repaired. And next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezabel, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Bana, repaired. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord. And the rest of this chapter reads very similarly. This chapter details the wall, who built it, who was in charge, and it becomes this unique chapter in all of God's word. Sounds real exciting, doesn't it? When Pastor Dave told me he'd be on vacation this week and asked me to preach, I said, absolutely, I would love to do so. And then I read this chapter. (laughs) I don't know about you, but I don't enjoy reading instruction manuals. And that's exactly what Nehemiah chapter 3 is. It's very technical, very dry, if you will. But God's word, all of it is helpful, isn't it? All of it is good. Isn't it? Nehemiah chapter 3 certainly is no exception. We see this and we understand the impact of this very unique chapter. I want to take just a moment and kind of unpack it. This chapter, what we've just read, serves as a basic structure to the rest of the chapter. So-and-so built the wall to a gate or or to a place. And next to him, so-and-so built the wall to a gate or to a place. And next to him, and next to him, and next to him, and so on and so forth. There's an organization to this chapter, and there's truth in the organization. Now, I'm just a simple boy from East Texas, so I need to kind of organize this to help my mind and my heart understand what's going on in this instruction manual chapter. Number one, there is a plan. Nehemiah chapter 3 helps us understand that there is a plan. I want you just to consider for a moment that Nehemiah 3 is written in the third person, while most of Nehemiah is written in the first person. And if you read all three Nehemiah chapter 3, it kind of reads as if the wall has already been completed. They repaired the wall. They set its doors and its gates and its bolts. It almost feels like it's out of sequence, and it is. And what's interesting about that is if we read through the rest of Nehemiah, Most of us may think, well, the wall's rebuilt after Nehemiah chapter 3. I guess we're good. We can finish up that series. Well, there's a whole lot that happens while they're in the process of doing this. 
So this out-of-sequence order is unique and I think provides for us a unique picture of what the writer of Nehemiah is trying to do. Opposition is coming to God's people as they rebuild this wall. Pain and heartache and struggle and sweat and blood and tears, they're all coming as they rebuild this wall. I think it's out of sequence to provide a sense of hope for the reader. That as opposition comes in chapter 4, they will have already known, wait, wait a second, the opposition may seem bad, but the wall has been completed. It will be done. I think it's interesting, too, that whatever you're going through in life, or at work, with your kids, however difficult, however painful, however struggle, can I just tell you that we've got a book that provides for us a hope because we know how it ends? Can I just tell you there's coming a time and place where Jesus will return and he will make all things new? Can I tell you sometimes when I look at the internet or when I see the news on the TV, I just pray this simple prayer, Lord Jesus, come. Because we can't fix it. Only he can fix it. There's coming a time where we as believers who are in Christ will be made new. I know how your story ends. For those of us who are in Christ, there is a great hope, a great peace, an eternality to life that we certainly cannot fathom, but we can get a glimpse of the Scripture of what heaven will be like in this relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit for all of eternity. So I don't know what you're going through today, but I can tell you there is hope. And Nehemiah chapter 3 is a hope kind of chapter that's needed before we get to chapter 4 and so on. There is a plan even in the sequence of this chapter. But there's also a plan as this chapter begins to unfold. What's interesting here is they start out with Eliashib. Eliashib is a high priest over Jerusalem. He's probably not known for his manual labor or his ability to build walls. But certainly as we see him as the first character of this, instruct, this construction project taking place, it helps us, the reader, know there's, this is more than a construction project. That there is spiritual implications to this wall going up. It's more than a wall. That completing the wall would be completing God's vision for the people. And that for Nehemiah, Nehemiah is saying, hey, this isn't just a wall. Because this wall is bigger than all of us. We need the Lord to give us his grace and his strength and his mercy and his power to be able to do and accomplish what he has called us to do. The spiritual tone of this entire project starts as we see the high priest leading out to complete the wall. And we see Eliashib and his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. Now, the sheep gate in the Hebrew means sheep gate. It was a gate. Yeah, you guys were like, what does it mean? It was a gate where they brought all the very good sheep in. <laughs> Sometimes we complicate the scripture, and it's not that complicated. They brought the sheep in. Here is the gate where they would bring in the sacrifices brought to the Old Testament temple. And so at the very onset, not only do you see Eliashib starting the work, but he's reestablishing the sheep gate, reminding the people that there is a process to worship here. And it's almost as if he's saying, hey, first things first. We've got to rebuild the wall, but let's do it in such a way that, that certain things have my pro more priority over other certain things. We must be a people that honor and worship the Lord correctly. And according to their Old Testament law and traditions, that's what they needed to do. So they started there. There's a plan in all of this. There's a plan in the sequence. There's a plan in the order of the work. It's, it's not just pointing to hope, but it's pointing to a holiness. That they're in this plan, God is working out some incredible things. Now there's organization here. Now, some of you who are really smart have already read through chapter 3, and you will have counted that there are 40 work crews to complete 45 different sections 
of construction. Now, Nehemiah, just a cupbearer, certainly has a gift of administration and the gift of organization. And he's put all of this together. Chapter 3 is a, a chapter about organization. And some of you are thinking, wait, 40 crews, 45 sections. Yeah, you've already caught on that some crews did more than one section. But there was a plan. There was systematic. It was intentional. And in the end, it got it done. There's a plan. Secondly, as we read through Nehemiah chapter 3, there is participation. There's participation. If you read through the entire chapter, we just read the first five verses, and we see different kinds of people coming to rebuild the wall. There are those who are nobles, and there are those who are high priests, and there's the -the middle-of-the-road Jews. We see merchants and goldsmiths and perfumers is what it says in verse 8. We see people from within the city helping. We see people from outside the city, good old country folk coming into the city to do the work. Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 12 reads, Next to Shalom was the son of Helosh, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired he and his daughters. Even the girls got in on the work. And I love that. Truthfully, there are probably a lot more women that were involved in repairing the wall. This is just what is recorded. Every kind of background, every kind of skill, all were involved. Teamwork makes the dream work. Their participation was a a collaborative effort of all of them coming together, willing to do things that maybe some of them had never done or some were had real skill, but they were willing to come together to accomplish God's vision. And then there's this cooperative effort. They came together and worked side by side. Some pulled double duty, as we mentioned earlier. There's even one who's mentioned in chapter 3, verse 20, Baruch, who zealously repaired another section. He had such an excitement about him, a, a willingness to come together to get the work done, that he was recorded as being one who was zealous, full of excitement. And these days, it didn't matter who it was, they were all together cooperating towards a common goal. Can I just tell you that we can sometimes be together without being cooperative? But here, they're together and they're cooperating. And how do we know that? What's interesting here, throughout the scripture, throughout this entire chapter, we see some phrases that are connecting the work crews together. Now, these different work crews from different geographies and different places and time are coming together to serve, but they're connected. Scripture says, next to him was so-and-so, and and next to them, so-and-so, after him, so-and-so. Time and time again, connecting all of these people together. It draws the illusion that side by side, shoulder to shoulder, they were rebuilding the wall at the same time. Working together to accomplish the impossible task. Teamwork makes the dream work. There's a plan, there was participation, but then certainly as we embark upon something only God can do, sin begins to rear its head. There is pride here. At the end of verse 5, we read about this pride. Scripture says in verse 5, And next to them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord. If you have a New American Standard Version of the Scripture, it says, would not support the work of their masters. The NIV reads, would not put their shoulders to the work. It's the idea they were unwilling to put their head down to work on this project. They willfully chose not to participate, not to to engage the work. Now, I want you to picture just for a second all of these people coming to rebuild all of the wall at the same time, yet these have got their heels in the ground and they're not going to do it. And all we can really understand is it just makes some allusions to why they don't do it. We can speculate that maybe they didn't agree with the vision to rebuild. There might have been labor involved. They didn't want to do that kind of labor. It could have been that there was an issue Being among the common men, they were nobles, in fact. Maybe they knew of the opposition to the wall, and they feared the oppressors. Whatever it was, their lack of involvement certainly reflected the condition of their hearts. 
Their hearts didn't see God's vision. Their hearts didn't believe in Nehemiah's leadership. The hearts didn't let them step out and partner in the vision. Rather, it allowed them to cement their feet in a posture of inactivity. Sometimes we can be together and not cooperate. These men were there, but they chose not to work. They missed the blessing, missed being used by God. They were spectators and not players in the game. We don't have time to unpack all of chapter 3, nor will we do that this morning. There's a lot of Old Testament names, and I'm going to butcher most of them. So how do we apply this? How do we apply this instruction manual of rebuilding the wall, of what God did to God's people to do an impossible task? A couple of things I would say this morning. We all play a part. That seems to be a a pretty logical application of this chapter. We all play a part. Vision needs people. Now, does God need people? No. Does God choose people? Yes. God's vision throughout Scripture implored and encouraged people to come alongside what he was doing. And he's asking people to be a part of his work. This last year, a year ago, we went through experiencing God, and and God, time to time, begins to just remind me of the principles that we read and heard and thought through and prayed through, that when God is at work, he's inviting me. He's inviting me to join him. He doesn't have to invite me, but he chooses to invite me. He doesn't need my hands or my labor or my experience, but he chooses to invite me. And is there another place on the planet I'd rather be than right in the middle of what God wants me to do? Vision needs people, and everyone plays a part. So whether we're here at Geyer Springs, whether you're living out your Christian life at your home, your neighborhood, or your workplace, if God has given you a vision, he's given you a part to play. From the oldest to the youngest, from the most gifted to the least among us, everybody here has a part to play. Jesus provides an example of what this might look like in the church. Luke chapter 21, he's observing the offering being taken at the temple, and he notices a poor widow. And that's how he describes her, a poor widow. So not only is she poor now, but as a widow, she probably will not be able to get out of her plight in life. This poor widow provides two mites. And the scripture says that although there was clanging going on from wealthy people giving to the offering, what she gave out of her sacrifice was commended. That we should be like her, willing to give it all. She just had two mites a huge part to play as she becomes an example for how we ought to play our part. Many of you think, well, I don't have much to give. I don't have much to offer when it comes to God's vision. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a singer. What else is there? We all play a part. Whether you're up front or out back, whether you're seen or unseen, whether you've got something to say or you're just serving with your hands, we all play a part in God's vision. Listen, personally, I'm never more satisfied in life than I'm in the middle of a God-sized vision doing what he's called me to do. And the reason I think I feel that way is because I'm a part of something that's much bigger than me. Me left up to me, pretty ordinary. But me following on God and what he has for me can be extraordinary. Not because of me, but because of God and his power and his giftingness and his mercy and his grace to us. By God's design, we all play a part. Paul unpacks this picture in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as he describes the church, that we are a church. We are one body built up of many parts. Jesus is the head of the body. We all play a part in the body. And I love that that illustration because it reminds us from the little toe to the brain, we all have something to offer and something to be a part of. Listen, for us to be a part of God's vision, we apply chapter 3 when we realize, hey, I play a part. And if you choose not to play your part, you choose to kind of sit back in the pew, you choose to kind of rest on your heels when it comes to being engaged in God's work and God's vision, can I just tell you, you're going to miss the blessing. 
You're going to miss what God can do in you and through you, how he will raise you, how he will equip you, how he will help you. You're going to miss seeing parts of your spiritual life that you've never seen before because you haven't actively been involved in ministry, actively be involved in how God works and, and loves his people. When we just sit back and rest, I think we minimize the impact the Spirit can have on our life. Because we sitting back is about our agenda. It's about what makes us comfortable. But if we're pressing forward on our toes, asking God, where do you want me to join you? How do you want me to join you? I want to be invited by you to be a part of your work. If we're on our toes leaning into that, and God says, you know, I've got a, a willing family right here who can be a part of the work that I'm engaging in in this community. I've got a, a willing man who's, who's saying, you know what, in my workplace, I will, I will help people know who Jesus is. I've got a willing student who at school will set aside time to read his scripture and engage in Bible study and disciple somebody else. When all God needs are willing people to be a part of his work, and God can do the impossible task. I think secondly, as we apply this, we're stronger together. Not that similar to that we all kind of play a part, but we're part of a larger system. It's vital that we understand that we are a team together. Speaking of this sermon title, John Maxwell said this, Teamwork makes the dream work, but a dream becomes a nightmare if a leader has a big dream and a bad team. I think there's a lot of truth to that. That a team is best when everyone works together. It's one thing to show up dressed out and say, I put me in, coach. But if you're unwilling to play with the team, you may not be the best teammate. A bad team is when we go into God's vision with our own agendas. We see this in churches all over America. Being pulled apart because somebody has an agenda that may be not what God's vision is. Being a part of a team is realizing who the coach is, and certainly that's Jesus Christ who's leading us and guiding us, and it's his word that we follow the playbook to be a part of his vision and his work. A bad team is one that forgets to care for one another along the way. I love the fact that we just walked through Acts, Acts chapter 2, that they were fellowshipping together, they were having meals together, they were praying together, they were loving each other well together, and they were helping each other as each had a need. That's the mark of a great team. That we're not so busy doing the work that we forget to love one another. I think Jesus might have mentioned that in the scripture, that the world around us will know that we are truly his disciples by our love for one another. A good team loves each other. A bad team doesn't persevere. Doing the Lord's work is not easy. Being a part of his vision may not be very easy. In fact, it may, may require sacrifice. It may require time and energy and finances. It, it may require for you to step out of your comfort zone. Maybe you've got to say a hard word or do a hard thing. Being a part of God's vision certainly can be pretty difficult. You might even have opposition on your right and on your left. Paul says it this way, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. This is why he goes on to say, let us not stop in doing good, but let us run the race as if we're running for the prize. I think it's important that we understand that we're stronger together. Lastly, let's apply it this way. I think chapter 3 reminds me of kind of how I got involved or how some of you got involved in ministry in the first place, that participating in vi big vision is easier when we first participate in small vision. Now hear me, I I'm not saying that you can't do big things for God unless you've done small things for God. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's easier to jump all in to God's great big vision if you've been faithful to respond in the little ways with little obedience along the way. It's easier to jump off the mountain if you've been to the trampoline park a couple of times. So get involved. Get involved in small ways. Be a part about some little things that may be happening here at church or in your neighborhood or, or with some of our nonprofit ministry partners 
Get involved in little things. And as you do that, God's going to grow your heart to be a part of his vision in greater and bigger ways. So if you're a student, if you're a preteen, if you're a child, get involved now. Get a taste for what it feels like to serve others and to give and to help be a part of God's vision and mission to redeem lostness here in our community. The first recollection I have being involved in ministry, I was in eighth grade, I was 14, and my uh, youth pastor said, hey, do you want to go to a kid's camp and you could be a junior counselor? And I thought, that's awesome. I have a title. Well, I didn't know it was going to be 130 degrees outside, you know, with no air conditioning, and that a junior counselor had kitchen duty three meals a day. And I got to run the videotape recorder, that's right, videotape recorder during recreation. Listen, I loved it. First church I ever served as a student pastor, I was 17 years old, and we averaged 50 people. And student ministry meant third grade through unless you were married. That's what it meant. (laughs) And I loved it. First sermon I ever preached. I preached in my youth group at 16 years old. It was 13 minutes long. And I loved it. Listen. Some of you were sitting in your chair and go, listen, I want to be a part of God's vision. I don't know where to start. Sometimes that just means starting small. Be a greeter. Hold the door open. That doesn't require a lot. If you're a greeter, I'm not insulting you. I'm just saying. (laughs) It's a handshake, a hug, and a welcome. It doesn't require a lot. Join the choir. Sing. They don't care if you don't sing well. Just sing. You know what children workers need? They need crowd control people. Guess what that means? You don't have to teach a lesson. That's what that means. But you're just there to love kids. Be a van driver. You haven't lived until you've had 13 kids in the back seat of your van telling you all kinds of stuff, right? Sometimes it's just about starting small. Nehemiah chapter 3, as you start it, you're like, what is this? Is the most boring chapter in, in all. But there's so much here about how God works among his people, taking ordinary people, doing an extraordinary thing. Teamwork makes the dream work, and God gets the glory when God's people come together to accomplish something that we can't do on our own. So I'm challenging you. What in your life? How in your life? Where in your life are you involved in something only God can do? And are you responding in a way that's helping make the dream 